Nathan, Billionaire Bear Shifters of Denver Book One Written by Candace Ayers Narrated by Erin Marie Chapter One Jason's lights flashed us from behind. I think he wants us to pull over, Tim stated the obvious. I turned my gaze to the left side window. Sure enough, a sign for a gas station emerged from the overgrowth of trees. Great, I could use a Coke. I was dangerously low on caffeine intake and felt that the responsibility of keeping this camping trip upbeat rested mainly on my shoulders. If I was going to play matchmaker, then I needed fortification. Both cars pulled into the parking lot and I hurried out of the back seat, instantly overcome by the ferocity of the afternoon heat. It was intense practically suffocating without a hint of a breeze. Tim and Jake, the two guys up front, followed me out. Laker, one of my co-workers who'd been riding in the back with me, groaned as soon as his shoes hit the hot pavement. Chloe, you need to use the restroom, don't you? Brianna approached me, her hands jammed on her hips. Behind her, Jason and the rest of his passengers were making their way inside the station. Sure, um, yeah. I replied brightly, feigning innocence. I knew that Brianna was annoyed with me. We walked to the restroom in silence. Once we were inside, Brianna checked the stalls and then turned on me. What the hell's going on? She hissed. Why am I riding in a car with complete strangers while you ride with both Laker and Jake? You know Jason, I replied defensively. No, I met him a couple of times, but... All those guys know each other, and it's super awkward, not to mention that Janine is insanity personified. Janine was Tim's ex-girlfriend, and admittedly, a total nightmare. She and Tim dated for years before he finally managed to break it off, but she still seemingly refused to let him go anywhere without her. Sorry about Janine, I sighed. I was really hoping that you and Jason would hit it off. My sentence spluttered into silence as Brianna narrowed her eyes in a vicious glare. Is this whole trip one of your matchmaking sessions? Busted. No, not exactly, Brie. Listen, I just think Jason is an awesome guy, and I also think that if you'd only talk to one another, you'd see the same. Chloe! She hid her face behind her hands in frustration. I'm sorry. I was starting to feel a little bit guilty. I really did think this trip would be fun. Work's been so crazy, and we've hardly spent any real time together. I thought we could all do with some getting back to nature type activity. Brianna rolled her eyes at me, and then turned toward the mirror over the sink to inspect her makeup. It will be fun, she replied eventually. It's fine. But... Promise me you'll ease up on the Jason thing. He's really not my type, and I don't think he's into me. I smiled at her reflection. I had won. I also had it on good authority, from the man himself, that Jason was interested in Brianna. He just had no idea what to do about it. So, continued Brianna, putting the pieces together, you suffered the torture of riding with Stalker Tim so that I could hook up with Jason? She asked with a small, mischievous smile starting to spread across her face. Yes, I exclaimed, realizing I could win back some friendship points. I did, though, to be honest, he's been cool. Brianna nodded, but didn't remove her smirk. Tim had pretty much asked me out every month or so throughout college, and then for another three years after that, including while he was dating Janine. The first few times, I declined politely. After that, it had gotten offensive, and now I was left in a place where I point-blank ignored his come-ons. That's true friendship, she laughed. Okay, you're forgiven. Can we leave now, so I can get a soda? Sure, but those things will rot your teeth. I gave her a megawatt smile, showing off my pearly white teeth to prove a point. She shrugged and muttered something about home whitening kits, which I ignored. Soda was a necessity. Chapter 2 It's creepy out here, Janine whined, cozying up to Tim on the fallen log. We'd set up camp as soon as we arrived, finding a spot at the base of the mountain we'd all climb tomorrow. The area was densely wooded, but we'd managed to find a small clearing where previous campers had artfully arranged fallen logs in a circle around a burnt patch of soil. I thought we'd done really well on the setup. 
The woods didn't fall creepy at all. Janine was just using it as an excuse to get Tim's attention. In a way, I was grateful. Laker and Jake had collected dead branches and dried leaves to start a fire, and then argued for about a half hour on the best way to arrange it. I lost my patience and built it myself. Now our faces were lit by the flickering of red and orange flames, making us all look slightly sunburned as we sat and roasted marshmallows on the end of spindly twigs. This was my favorite part of summer, the long evenings when it was still warm, the smell of wood burning, and all of us speaking in low, muted tones so as not to disturb the creatures of the forest. I felt perfectly drowsy. We'd all had a couple of beers after dinner, and the alcohol combined with the hypnotic light of the fire sent me into a meditative state where time seemed to stand still. I smiled over at the figures on the log opposite me. Brianna and Jason were finally talking, sitting slightly apart from everyone else. Bam. As I watched, Brianna stood up and walked around the fire to where I was sitting. Hey, what are you doing? I asked quietly. You're finally talking to him. Don't stop now. Brianna sighed theatrically. We're just talking. I'll go back later, but I need to pee. Help a girl out in her hour of need? Oh. This was the major drawback of outdoor pursuits as far as I was concerned. But I wasn't about to let Brianna walk off into the forest by herself. Okay, fine. Let's go. I've got a flashlight. I dug around in my backpack and fished out the equipment we needed. Hygiene wipes, hand sanitizer, and a flashlight. Brianna was impressed, but not surprised. My hyper-efficient organizational skills fluctuated between being amusing and awe-inspiring to the other employees at Barefoot PR the public relations firm where we both worked. To me, being organized was a necessity and came as naturally as breathing. Are you sure you don't have a porta potty in there as well? Brianna snickered. You laugh, but I really wish I did. I sighed as we walked off into the darkness of the forest. When we couldn't see the camp lights anymore, I decreed that we'd gone far enough. We'd stayed side by side as the forest had become eerie with only a flashlight to guide us, casting shadows that shifted and moved as we walked. Okay, now I think I'm too spooked to pee, Brianna hesitated as she glanced around the chosen spot. Don't be silly. Come on, Bri. The faster you do your thing, the faster we can be back at camp, I reasoned. I held the flashlight by a tree and turned away to respect her privacy. Chloe, I hear something. Brianna whispered quietly. I turned back. She was frozen in fear as she squinted into the depths of the dark forest. I was about to tell her not to be so jumpy when a low rumble seemed to shake the soil beneath us. I could hear bushes being thrashed aside and tree branches being snapped as if some great bulk of a thing was tumbling toward us. What the hell is that? I whispered back, too frightened to move. My legs felt like they were going to collapse beneath me at any moment. Instinctively, I wanted to shine the flashlight in the direction of the noise, but I refrained. If whatever it was happened to be passing, then I didn't want to attract attention. I threaded my arm through Brianna's and flicked the light off. What are you doing? I hardly heard Brianna's hysterical plea. The noise was getting closer, as if it was headed straight toward us. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw the trees tremble ahead and then shake violently. A deafening roar, solitary and vicious, splintered the air. I ducked, shielding my face with my arm as something flew out of the trees toward us. Whatever it was yelped as it hit the ground. I was able to focus enough to see a massive heap of fur lying motionless at our feet, no more than a yard away from us. As I watched, the furry heap moaned pitifully and rolled onto its back. Thick fur, a muzzle, sharp claws, grizzly. It was a huge grizzly bear. Its sheer size alone was terrifying. The fluffy fur, small ears, and inquisitive eyes that I associated with the cuddlier version of the animal did nothing to quell my fear as I gazed at the 800 pounds or so of muscle and brute strength lying before us. As it moaned in pain, its jaw stretched to reveal a ferocious, blood-stained set of canines. It's hurt, murmured Brianna. The poor thing. What? Brianna, don't, please, don't go near it. We need to back away, quietly, come on. I tried to keep my voice at a whisper, but anxiety turned it into a high-pitched sonar-like shrill instead. The bear turned its head in our direction. We need to help it, I think it's bleeding, Brianna replied, 
completely ignoring me as she rose from her crouched position. Or it just caused something else to bleed, I spat. We need to go. She stepped toward it. It whined again and tried to move off its back. Brianna paused. I could see her body, like mine, trembling in fear. But she continued, regardless, edging her way toward it, cooing softly as though it was a newborn. I refused to abandon her. As much as every part of my body was desperate to turn and run, I wasn't about to leave my idiot friend with the creature that could snap her neck in a matter of seconds. Chapter 3 Excuse me, ma'am. Can you please step away from the animal? The man startled me almost as much as the bear had. I jumped, emitting a strange squeaking sound and landing badly, twisting my ankle on a small rock. I'd been so preoccupied with Brianna and the bear that I hadn't heard him approach. He shone a flashlight in my face, and I grimaced and covered my eyes, wondering why the hell I was targeted suspicion, and not the killer grizzly lying prostrate on the ground. Can you not do that? I replied haughtily. The man lowered his light, but did not apologize. Are you a forest ranger or something? I asked, relieved to have some backup. The man was silent for a moment before he replied, Yeah, a forest ranger. You ladies both need to go back to wherever it was you came from. I'm guessing the camp's that way. He waved his light in the direction we'd just come. Yes. I think the bear's badly hurt, Brianna interjected. What are you going to do? Do you have a truck or something? How are you going to help him? I looked around but saw no sign of a vehicle. The man seemed to have appeared out of nowhere. My truck is about a mile back. I'll drive it up here and haul him on. <sighs> do it all the time. He sighed as if this was an annoying event that happened on a regular basis. How many fights did these bears get themselves into? Will the other one be back? I asked with slight trepidation. Do you think we should move camp? If the other bear was strong and vicious enough to be able to cause this beast harm, then there was no way I wanted to be intruding on its territory. Not tonight, no, he muttered darkly. You'll be fine. I tried to get a better look at the ranger, but the lack of light made it difficult. He was tall and broad-shouldered, with a more than capable-looking physique, but his face was almost fully cast in shadow. The only thing I could make out for sure was that he certainly didn't dress like a forest ranger. I could definitely make out dark wash jeans and a plain black t-shirt, but they looked clean and pressed, without a hint of forest debris or mud anywhere. You don't look like a forest ranger, I speculated out loud. I thought you guys all had those camel uniforms. It's my night off, he deadpanned. The forest ranger clearly wasn't a fan of ours. No doubt he saw it all the time. Urban dwellers who came to the forests and open landscapes of the Rockies to let off steam and get back to nature without knowing the basics, which I'm pretty sure included running the hell away from grizzly bears. Well, we'll be on our way. Bree? She hadn't taken her eyes off the bear and barely seemed to hear my invitation to leave. I could tell just by looking at her that she was desperate to reach out and touch its fur. Not a fan, then? The forest ranger asked. Huh? Of bears, I take it you're not a fan, he clarified, and I was sure I could detect the hint of a smirk on his face. They're awe-inspiring, I replied truthfully, but that doesn't mean I want to get close enough to get my head chewed off. Very sensible. I could definitely detect a hint of amusement lacing his tone, and it ticked me off. Brianna was the maniac here, not me. I would have expected a park ranger to applaud my good sense in keeping a safe distance. But then again, I already had the impression that this guy was probably the maverick of his ranger unit. Whatever. Bree, can we please get going? I think I twisted my ankle. I pleaded. It was beginning to throb, and the hike was going to be ruined tomorrow if I didn't prop it up and get some ice on it soon. Let me take a look. The ranger replied and started to approach me before I could protest. Is it bad? Brianna finally refocused and looked over. Really, it's fine. I tried to shrug off the pain. We should just get back. The ranger ignored me completely and bent down to look at my ankle. I felt his hands touch my leg, his fingers warm and firm as they felt around the bone. I winced when he touched a sore spot. He didn't say anything, but softly palmed my calf as if in an apologetic gesture. It's a bit swollen. Try not to walk on it tonight and put some ice on it. 
If you don't have ice, dip a towel in water and wrap it around the ankle, okay? I nodded before realizing that he couldn't see me. Yes, okay. Suddenly, I wasn't feeling that chatty. At this close range, I noticed just how broad and muscular the man was. His t-shirt strained over his thick shoulders, giving me an ample view of the bulging bicep muscles and the tone definition of his forearms. He wore his hair slightly long, pushed back behind both ears. As he inspected my ankle, tendrils dropped in front of his face and for a split second, I felt a strong urge to push them back off his forehead. Are we done? I said instead, my tone weirdly brisk and hoarse. We're done, he replied and straightened up. He towered over me. I'm average height, but in his presence, I felt minuscule. Thanks, I breathed. We'll go now. He nodded at me slowly, but I didn't move, and neither did he. I looked up and our eyes met. His face was still cast in shadow, but his eyes were hypnotic. They seemed to gleam in the darkness. His irises were an unusual midnight blue, but the tones within appeared as if they were moving and shifting, sparking like electricity. The overall impression was like looking into the midst of an electrical storm. I looked away. My heart hammered irregularly in my chest. Are you ready? Brianna called, having picked up the flashlight where I must have dropped it on the ground. Yup, I gulped. Thanks, see you around, I muttered to the ranger's chest, unable to look up again. Yeah, see you, I hope he's okay, Brianna replied, looking back longingly at the bear. The ranger waved us off. I felt his eyes on us, following as we walked back toward the camp and the feeling didn't go away until we re-entered the clearing. It was only then that I could actually breathe again. Chapter 4 That night, Brianna and I had returned to camp, practically falling over ourselves to tell the tale of our bear adventure. We mentioned the ranger briefly. Brianna hardly seemed to have noticed him. It appeared that I was the only one who he'd made a lasting impression on. Later, curled up in my sleeping bag, I'd listened for his truck, but heard nothing. The next morning, our adventures were old news after Janine almost gotten bitten by a snake, and Laker found a scorpion curled up inside his boot. Jason and Brianna hadn't really spoken on the hike, and as we made the final descent, I had to give up on my matchmaking skills. No matter how many subtle ways Jason tried to vie for her attention, Bree just didn't seem to notice. In fact, she was more preoccupied with wondering how her bear was faring in his recovery. Now we were making our way back home on Route 36, sun-kissed and drowsy. Brianna sat next to me in the back of Tim's car, her head slumped on my shoulder as she snored softly in sleep. Gas station, I called out as we passed the sign. I really need some water. I need a smoke, Tim agreed and pulled over. I saw Jason's car do the same behind us. The station was run down, built from cinder block and corrugated tin. It looked like more of a shack than a gas station, which made the McLaurin P1 sports car parked out front all the more obvious. I only recognized the make because a few years ago they'd been a client of the PR firm where I worked. Those machines were upward of $800,000. Laker and Tim both emitted low, envious whistles and stopped in their tracks to stare longingly at the gleaming body. I carried on toward the entrance of the station, desperate for rehydration and air conditioning. The door swung open just as I was about to push. I stood back to let the customer pass and froze. It was the forest ranger. He was wearing the same clothes as yesterday, the dark denim jeans, black t-shirt, and, surprisingly, given the ensemble, some barely scuffed black converse. Finally, in the light of day, I could get a clear look at him. Good lord, he was magnificent. Last night, I noticed he was large and wide, but in daylight, it was obvious that the man was a wall of solid muscle. His chiseled jaw was clean-shaven, and his defined facial features portrayed remarkably classic good looks. His looks were marred only by the slightly too hollow cheeks and dark shadows under his eyes that gave him an edge which looked almost savage. I'd been wrong about his eyes. They were a dark midnight blue, but that's where the strangeness ended. I must have imagined the electric-like sparks that had stormed within them. How's your ankle? 
It took a minute for my brain to process. In fact, I was probably staring at him with my mouth hanging open. Uh, fine, fine, thanks for asking. He looked down at my bare legs. I suddenly wished I wasn't wearing such short shorts. His gaze traveled from my legs up my body slowly. The look in his eyes was raw and hungry with an intensity that made me feel exposed. I shuddered involuntary. Uh, how's the bear? I stuttered when it became apparent that he wasn't going to speak. Recovering. I saw him unconsciously flip a set of keys in his hands. The unmistakable logo of the McLaurin flashed in the sunlight. Was that the truck you carted him off in? I quipped, staring pointedly at the key. I thought about it, but blood's a nightmare to get off upholstery. He smirked at me, showing off a set of gleaming white teeth. I took a step back. They must pay you well. I didn't realize ranger positions were so lucrative. He raised an eyebrow at my pointed tone. Sorry, I blushed slightly. That was rude. Damn my lack of a filter. But in my defense, I couldn't quite merge the sharp, well-dressed man in front of me with the profession of a park ranger. He looked like he'd be more comfortable in a boardroom, despite the converse. It's fine, he shrugged. I have other interests. Chloe? A sharp questioning voice interrupted and Tim came to stand next to me, slinging an arm around my shoulder. I thought you were getting water. I shrugged him off, wanting to punch him in the ribs for thinking he could be this territorial around me when I was speaking to another guy. This is the park ranger. He rescued the injured bear? I replied. Tim held out his hand, but I could see that he was reluctant to do so. The ranger towered above Tim and was easily twice as broad. Tim Hutchins, nice to meet you. The ranger looked him up and down with a very different expression than the one he'd just adopted with me. Nathan, he replied tersely. He didn't shake Tim's proffered hand. Instead, he looked toward me, expectantly. I'm Chloe, Chloe Carpenter. He nodded, his expression contemplative. Very nice to meet you, Chloe Carpenter, he replied eventually. Nice to meet you, Nathan. The name sounded strange on my lips. It was a common enough name, but there was something that suddenly seemed so personal about referring to him that way. He walked back to his car, not saying another word. As I watched him move across the parking lot, I couldn't help but be reminded of a beast's prowl. There was so much repressed power and control in his movements. Tim and Laker watched him as greedily as I did. I saw Tim pale when the engine thundered to life and the machine revved out of the lot. I smiled to myself and went inside. Chapter 5 Monday came too soon. My whole body ached from the hike, hurting in places I didn't even know I had. Sunday night, I'd immersed myself in a bath with Epsom salts but it hadn't seemed to make the tiniest bit of difference to my aching muscles. I felt like I needed another weekend to recover from the one I'd just had. Brianna had called me later on Sunday night. I'd been dropped off around four, so I was surprised to hear from her so soon. She wanted to talk about the bear. How did I think he was? Where did I think the ranger was keeping him? She'd been looking up bear sanctuaries online, but couldn't find any in the immediate Denver area. I hadn't known how to respond other than to repeatedly soothe her anxiety with unfounded reassurances. Her behavior was odd, but in truth, it was no stranger than mine. Since we'd seen the ranger, Nathan, at the gas station, I'd never met a man who had such an effect on me. I'd met guys I thought were hot before, of course I had. I'd also experienced that little fission of excitement and dreamy headspace as I launched into a fully blown crush. But this was different. I didn't know the guy at all, but everything about him intrigued me. His physique, his face, the way his voice sounded, the memory of his warm touch that refused to fade. It all drew me in, preoccupying me so that every thought I had, every action I took, was saturated with the sexiest sin Ranger Nathan. That's how I started my day, thinking of him as I walked the few blocks down to 8th Avenue to work. I stopped off at Starbucks for a non-fat latte which was ready and waiting for me at the counter when I arrived, and then practically glided through the doors to my office. Looking good, doll baby. Hiking obviously agrees with you. Corey called out from behind the reception desk to me as I crossed the lobby. He looked as good as he usually did, 
Clearly, he'd spent another productive weekend at the gym and topping up his tan. I'm not feeling so hot on the inside, trust me. Everything hurts, I moaned in reply. No pain, no gain. And quit whining. Deborah is on the warpath this morning. I rolled my eyes at Corey. He was such a drama queen, highly tuned into the emotional nuisances of our boss. He seemed to live and die by her mood swings. I could handle Deborah. She could be frosty, but I respected her a great deal, and that made all the difference. It meant that I could tolerate some of her less redeeming aspects. The package as a whole was worth it. She'd brought me in two years ago to set up the digital team at the PR firm that she'd created from scratch. When she'd brought me in, it was just her and Brianna in Deborah's front room. They had been growing rapidly, but they were behind the times when it came to digital and social marketing. I now had a team of five working for me, and the firm as a whole was reputed to be the best in the state. Deborah came marching toward me, her stiletto heels rapping sharply on the wooden floors. I need you in the bargain meeting. The comms manager just called me to say they want digital input. What time? I replied, unfazed by her brisk tone. I've got a call with Yogo. Do you want me to reschedule? Yogo was a new trendy yogurt drink that was just about to launch in North America. We'd only just won the pitch. Rescheduling it wouldn't be ideal, but Deborah knew that. You'll have to. Sorry. She swept past me and I continued on to my office texting my perpetually late but nevertheless brilliant PA. Hopefully, she could reschedule the call for later in the day. How are you feeling, Chloe? Laker called out to me from the water cooler. I smiled and waved, not having time to stop. If I was going to be in a meeting with a client in an hour, I needed to do some prep work, stat. Deborah had spoken to me about the Varga client last week, but I'd been focused on two ongoing pitches at the time, and most of it had gone in one ear and out the other. All I could recall was that the company was heavily involved in surgical and medical products. I did a search online and found their site. It was what you'd expect from a business-to-business enterprise. Blue and white design cues of the medical industry, somber fonts, and lengthy detailed texts. There was a For Investors tab, and I clicked on that. It sent me to a page with streams of press release links on financial profits, and a few recent photos of a company event. Nothing of particular value. But I couldn't find out who owned the company, if anyone actually did, or who the major shareholders were. Are you coming to the meeting? Brianna poked her head around the office door. I looked at my watch. I had managed to have a hugely unproductive hour. I am. Any heads up on this thing? I hissed at her as we sped to the central meeting room. Not much. I can fill you in later. Basically, they want the same thing all major corporations want a friendly face, and a Twitter feed. You'll be fine. Who are we meeting? The CEO, Nathan Varga, head of marketing, Lucy Fielding, and a couple of other marketing heads. Another Nathan. I sighed, frustrated. Having the name of a key client replicating the name of my strange obsession wasn't going to help me get over him. I took a sip of coffee and forced myself to stay focused. Ranger Nathan would be forgotten within a week. Nathan Varga, CEO and head of Varga Corporation, would mean thousands of dollars worth of business pumping into our company coffers. Chapter 6 Lucy Fielding was an attractive, willowy woman in her late 30s. I warmed to her immediately as she entered the room. I generally liked seeing women heading up departments in Fortune 500 companies, and she had an easy manner that set a relaxed tone for the start of the meeting. I'm sorry, Nathan's running late. He had a conflicting appointment that's running over, unfortunately. She smiled brightly at Deborah, Brianna, and me. In the meantime, it would be great if you could take me through your usual process. I'm particularly interested in amplifying our digital presence, so if you could start with that? Sure, I returned the smile. I can show you a couple of case studies as well if we have the time. I didn't normally like giving presentations without any prior notice, but our digital process deck was something I'd talked through with clients hundreds of times before. I was halfway through when Corey announced Nathan Varga's presence. I looked up, my client-friendly smile at the ready. Standing in the doorway to the meeting room, taking up the entire doorframe, was Forest Ranger Nathan, except this man looked every inch the CEO of a billion-dollar company. He was dressed in an impeccable gray suit and white shirt with his longish hair tucked neatly behind his ears. Deborah and Brianna turned to stand and welcome him. I watched Brianna look confused, as if she vaguely recognized him, 
but clearly dismissed the thought and welcomed him in a professional manner. I wasn't as capable. He came toward me, arm outstretched in greeting. I shook his hand slowly, feeling the goosebumps run up my arm and over my body as his warm skin touched mine. I'm Nathan Barga. Pleased to meet you. His tone was formal, giving little indication that we'd met before, but his eyes said something else. They were teasing, challenging, daring me to say something. Two can play at that game. I smiled as breezily as I could. Chloe Carpenter. A pleasure to meet you, Mr. Varga. He cocked an eyebrow and shot me a quick smirk before taking a seat at the table. It seems I was interrupting something. Please, go ahead, Miss Carpenter, he drawled. I nodded and turned back to the screen, trying to recall what the hell I'd been saying before he came in. The words on the deck seemed to swim and dance completely nonsensical. Starting to panic, I looked over at Deborah. Her face was turning puce as I stood there, unable to speak. Though it said I'd be getting my ass chewed later, Deborah's look saved me. My job swam back into focus. Nathan Varga might very well look like sex on a stick. He also might very well be a deadly stalker tracking me all over the greater Denver area. But he was also our client. Deborah didn't pay me to stand, admire, and drool. The meeting progressed without any more hitches. Lucy did most of the talking, outlining what they were looking for in terms of creating an approachable face for the company. I tried not to stare at Nathan as we were discussing the project, but I couldn't seem to tear my eyes away. He didn't belong in that suit. Not that it didn't look good, it looked amazing, but there was something about him that made the suit resemble a shackle, like he wanted to break free of the confining tie and button shirt, shed his clothing completely, and... and what? Oh crap, where was my mind going? I blushed as he caught my eye. I looked away. Honestly, in that moment, I irrationally wondered if he was psychic. I hoped to God he wasn't hearing my thoughts. He cleared his throat, a strange gurgle of a sound that was suspiciously like suppressed laughter. I glared at him sharply, but his face was a mask of composure. It was lovely to meet you, Chloe. Lucy smiled at me as we shook hands goodbye. The digital approach you guys take is fantastic. I'm really looking forward to us working together. I nodded in agreement, pleasantly surprised by her enthusiasm. Clearly, I hadn't been that bad. I couldn't agree more. Nathan's voice was quiet as he leaned toward me. He placed a hand firmly on my upper arm, moving me a step back. I glanced to see what everyone else was making of this, but they were all preoccupied with the removal of laptops and swapping business cards. Chloe, have dinner with me tonight. His words were a gentle murmur. I looked up into his eyes. Their midnight depths burned brightly with amusement, and I couldn't help but wonder if this was all a game to him. Was I a mouse to his predator? I don't think that's a good idea. I hissed back. Besides, who would I be going out with, the park ranger or the CEO? I instantly got the impression that he hadn't expected that response. His eyebrows rose, and inwardly I laughed with glee at finally being able to turn the tables on him. I'll explain. I promise. Please consider dinner. I won't bite. I hesitated, weighing the pros and cons. Dinner with the man I was undeniably attracted to. Okay, obsessed with, really. But who could also be a crazed stalker and some sort of weird billionaire bear hunter? Hmm. I will explain, and we can go anywhere you choose. Fine, I agreed eventually. Pick me up here at seven. Here. Here, I repeated adamantly. I wasn't comfortable with him knowing where I lived. Not yet. Deborah made her way over, giving me warning eyes. She was obviously correctly concluding that I had the hots for the guy and wanted me firmly back in my professional box. At seven, he confirmed and walked out with his employees. What was that about? Deborah asked sharply as she smiled at their retreating backs. Nothing, I lied smoothly. Seems everyone is digital crazy these days. She gave me a look and then folded her arms. Careful, Chloe, she warned. I need this client. I nodded meekly, feeling guilty. If she found out I was having dinner with Nathan, she would not be pleased. I vowed I'd have one meal with the guy and then gently untangle myself from this obsession, for the sake of my job and my sanity. Chapter 7 
Deborah left at six, as I hoped she would. That gave me an hour to transform myself in the office restrooms, and I roped in an enthusiastic Corey to help. About six months ago, I had signed up on a dating app. It had been fun for about two months, and had frequently had several dates lined up during the week. After a while, though, I'd lost interest. The men were fun, and I'd enjoyed myself, but I hadn't really found any connections that sparked my interest. However, as a result of my dating spree, I'd kept a few dresses in the office and a full makeup bag for last-minute emergencies. I chose the most casual dress I could find, a dusty pink skater dress which complemented my skin tone and dark hair. I was wearing gold strap sandals already and didn't want to change into anything with a heel. With the dress, it would be overkill. Hair down, princess, commanded Corey. I unraveled it from the tight bun I'd been wearing and then let Corey go to town on with my makeup. Don't go all out. Just natural, please, Corey, I begged. He tended toward drag queen creativity if he wasn't reined in. I know what I'm doing, he sighed. Trust me, I'm so jealous, by the way. Nathan Varga is gorgeous. You know he's a billionaire, right? Where are you going tonight? Please tell me it's somewhere fancy. I laughed. Rioa on Larimer. It was my choice. What? You could have gone anywhere. We go there all the time. Corey was disgusted with my choice. I guess, in his opinion, it was a complete waste of a date with a billionaire. I chose it because it had good food and a terrace area, so if we got stuck for conversation, there would be plenty of people watching to do. Corey stood back to admire his handiwork. I checked myself out in the mirror. He'd done a good job. It barely looked like I was wearing any makeup, but he'd done a fair amount of genius contouring so that my cheekbones appeared more prominent and my skin seemed to glow. Oh, Corey, you're my fairy godmother. Thank you. Thank me by inviting me to the wedding and private pool parties. He winked at my reflection, and I rolled my eyes. At least one of us was wildly optimistic about the success of the evening. Okay, I'd better wait out front. He's going to be here soon. Wait! Corey squealed at me. I turned to him alarmed, and he liberally covered me in perfume. Jesus, Corey, I don't want to smell like a department store. Enough. Perfect, smiled Corey, ignoring me. I left him smiling in satisfaction as I strutted out of the office and went to wait by the entrance. As soon as I left Corey, my confidence started to diminish and I felt the nerves that I'd been holding at bay all afternoon return. I was grateful, at least, that we'd be going to a restaurant I knew. Hopefully it would make the experience less overwhelming, but I had my doubts. Nathan's car was waiting for me as I exited the building. It was the same one I'd seen in the gas station over the weekend. He opened the door when he saw me and rose out of the car. Had it been anyone else, I would have noted the good manners with approval, but in Nathan Varga, it only served to make me more skittish. You look absolutely beautiful, Chloe. The compliment and the matching smile were given lightly, but his midnight eyes were intense as they watched me approach. Thank you, you look nice yourself. He was still wearing his suit, but it was as fresh and uncrumpled as it had been this morning. Either Nathan had a closet full of matching outfits, or he'd done nothing all day but sit in an office chair controlling his empire with the touch of a button. I didn't know which one was more plausible. I sunk into the plush seat, marveling at the interior. It looked like it was built for space travel, not cruising the streets of Denver. Where to? he asked. Rioa, do you know it? I do. He picked up his phone. Elle, give me a table for two on the terrace of Rioa. Yup, Rioa, he smirked down the line. Thanks. I'd completely neglected to make a reservation, It would be unlikely that we'd be able to get a table outdoors at this late notice, which threw a massive wrench in my people-watching backup plan. But then again, maybe Nathan's had some substantial influence in this town. She was surprised at the restaurant choice, I started, referring to his smirk. Very. It's good, I replied, but perhaps a little below your standards. Nope, I agree with you. 
it is good. It's just usually when I'm eating out, I'm wooing clients, and their tastes tend towards something flashier. This is a blessing, trust me. I emitted a small smile of satisfaction. Just having Nathan in such close proximity was playing havoc with my nervous system, but perhaps tonight would be more enjoyable than I had first anticipated. Chapter 8 When we arrived, we were shown to a terrace table immediately, and the maitre d' practically fell over himself trying to make us feel welcome. Okay, Nathan had a lot more influence in this town than I realized. Nathan caught my eye and smiled. I don't know if it was my imagination, but I got the idea he was slightly embarrassed by the attention. We ordered a bottle of wine and water for the table and then we're left alone with our menus. Do you know what you want? He asked. It took me a moment to realize he was referring to the food. I smiled smoothly and didn't bother to check the menu before I replied. The mixed seafood with fries. You? Steak. Rare. He replied, placing the menu back down on the table. With fries, of course. Of course. Well, at least we had something in common, even if it was as arbitrary as french fries. He leaned back in his chair, studying me. A silence fell between us, but it wasn't uncomfortable. I was just as interested in studying him. I tried to find the telltale signs of a man who spent a lot of time outdoors, but there was nothing. His hands, though large and capable looking, were smooth and clean, his nails clipped short. His face didn't convey ruddiness or windswept coloring. He was tan, but this was summer in Denver. We were all tan. Okay, so tell me, I asked, stumped. The park ranger thing. That was a lie, right? Not exactly. He started to rearrange the cutlery on the table and didn't meet my eye. I have hobbies, other interests besides my business. Babysitting bears currently seems to be one of them. It was a vague answer, and I was dissatisfied. You said you'd tell me. You promised. Can you be a bit more specific? That was me telling you, he smirked. Trust me, I can't really divulge more than that. He looked repentant and strangely subdued for a moment. You're not, I hesitated, doing anything weird with them, are you? Like, using them for animal testing? He laughed out loud. It was a relief. Nope. No science experiments. Our company doesn't do animal testing. But then I'm sure you already knew that. Now it was my turn to feel uncomfortable. Honestly, I was only asked to come to the meeting an hour before it was due to take place. I really don't know much about your company. He cocked an eyebrow in my direction, but before he could speak, the waiter came out to take our order. I took a sip of wine and settled back into my chair, enjoying the sunset's warmth without the afternoon glare as Nathan ordered for us both. I found it baffling that the man I was sitting with was the same man who tended to my ankle in the woods only a few nights ago. They seemed like they were two different people entirely, and it made me curious. I wondered which one was the real Nathan. The one in the thousand-dollar suit, sipping wine? Or the one who trekked the wilderness of the Rockies, tending to wild animals? Well, we don't do animal testing, and the bear is making a full recovery in a sanctuary not far from here. Which sanctuary? I asked, knowing Brianna would want to look them up. A good one, he replied sternly. Please trust me on this. The bear is safe, he added, a little gentler. I did trust him. I wasn't exactly sure why. I wasn't really in the habit of trusting strange men that appeared out of nowhere, who I then repeatedly bumped into. But with Nathan, I did. Perhaps it was wishful thinking, the desire for this man who made my pulse race to be honest, and good on the inside too. Whatever the reason, I uncharacteristically decided to let it go. Okay, I trust you. Thank you, he replied softly. The midnight blue of his eyes started to glow again, 
the electric flares dancing in his irises. I must have leaned in closer, because he jerked his head backwards and laughed softly to himself. You have a curious effect on me, Chloe Carpenter. I could say the same thing about you. I don't usually agree to go to dinner with clients. And I don't usually ask, he replied. But with you, I had to make an exception. I hope it doesn't cause any issues with your boss. I recalled the vow I'd made earlier to untangle myself and to gently assert that this wouldn't be going any further. Yet, I felt the desire to untangle and melt away with every passing second. Well, she doesn't need to know, right? We're both adults. I'm sure we can handle whatever it is this is. I finished lamely. This is me dating you, or trying to, once you stop wondering if I'm some crazy stalker, he quipped. Is it that obvious? Yes. I blushed. I had agreed to go out with him, and it did seem kind of rude to continue to doubt his motives. Still, what girl on a first date didn't keep an eye out for red flags? I'm sorry, it's just, you strike me as unusual. I said as delicately as I could. He wasn't offended, though I did feel like he was smirking at his own private joke. And you're not? He asked, leaning toward me. He reached out and ran his thumb across my bottom lip, just barely skating the skin. It was a wildly intimate gesture, and it sent molten lava running around my insides and down to my core. You're driving me crazy, Chloe Carpenter. What is it about you? He asked quietly, staring at me as if I was some great enigma that he hadn't managed to solve. My winning personality? I croaked, trying to lighten the mood. He smiled and removed his hand, which I immediately missed. I ached for him to reach for me again, wanting to feel the heat of his touch. I cursed my flippant response. It was such a classic reaction of mine when faced with any real intimacy. After that, we continued a more first-date line of conversation, brief summaries of childhood, families, schools, films, and books. The time flew by, till we were the only ones left in the restaurant, and the candle on our table was nothing but liquid wax. Let me drive you home? Nathan asked as we walked onto the avenue. I'll get a cab, I replied sleepily. It's easier. Easier for you to get home? or easier meaning less potentially complicated. Both? I smiled up at him, grateful that he understood. In the next moment, his arms were wrapped around me, solid and warm, and his body was pressed up against mine, hard and unyielding. I inhaled sharply at his surprising but not unwelcome boldness. His lips brushed my forehead, and I thought I heard a soft growl escape his chest. Let me see you tomorrow night. His voice sounded low and husky. Yes, I whispered, no longer able to pretend that I could stay away from this man any longer than 24 hours. His lips touched mine, lightly, sweetly, sealing the promise. I was the one that deepened the kiss, sliding my hand up his chest. He gripped the back of my neck, angling my head as our lips molded together. He tasted like wine and warmth. As his tongue gently brushed over the seam of my lips, they parted. I heard myself release a small moan as his tongue delved into my mouth, exploring, tasting. The man had my head spinning and my whole body tingling in a neurotic haze. His hand reached up to cut my face, his fingers lightly grazing my earlobes and shivers erupted around my neck. He ran his other hand down the curve of my spine, gently pushing my backside further into him as he firmly cupped my ass. Through the flimsy material of the skater dress, the heat of his touch was almost searing. The hardness of his erection dug into my abdomen. The sensation made my stomach flutter and my panties damp with arousal. We need to stop, he gasped. I can't. He didn't finish the sentence, but I was right there with him. I couldn't control myself. We were on a public street, but my body was responding to him like we were alone in a bedroom. I'll see you tomorrow. I replied, trying to get my breath back. He nodded and then physically stepped away, giving me some space. He turned and hailed a cab from the steady stream of traffic that hadn't abated despite the hour. One came all too soon. He opened the door for me, 
and then made sure the driver knew where he was going before letting me ride off. Alone in the cab, watching the bright lights of various bars and restaurants reflect on the window of the car, I sat back and exhaled. I still had so many unanswered questions about Nathan. Unanswered questions and a vague feeling that he wasn't quite what his image portrayed. I was certain that there was something else about him. Something that he was keeping hidden. I could feel it in my bones. What was even stranger was that, aside from overwhelming lust, when I'd been wrapped up in his arms and held against his warm body, I had felt safe. Safe and protected, as if the two of us together could hold the world at bay. Chapter 9 This the place, ma'am? The taxi pulled up outside my apartment building. Perfect, thanks. I've only got a 20. I waited for him to give me my change and then pulled myself out onto the sidewalk. It felt like it had grown slightly cooler since I'd said goodbye to Nathan, but it was probably just my fatigue starting to make itself known. I dug for my keys as I walked up the steps to the lobby entrance. My apartment was on the fourth floor of an old converted bottling factory. The factory had been divided up into modern apartments, all with an industrial decor, high ceilings, polished concrete floors, and huge old factory windows that let the cold in come winter and made it blazing hot in the summer. As I was struggling to get the lobby door open, cursing our super for not replacing the decades-old log, I noticed a man standing at the far end of the street. My building wasn't too near the main avenue, so it was rare for people to dwaddle in this area. His presence made me slightly uneasy, and I glanced the length of the street to see if anyone else was around, but found it otherwise deserted. Eventually, the lock gave, and relieved, I stumbled inside. Another man broad and muscular, dressed head to toe in black, was standing by the bank of mailboxes that ran alongside the right wall of the small lobby. He turned and nodded in my direction with disinterest. I figured he was a new resident in the building, so I returned the nod and made my way toward the elevator. I was starting to wish that I'd invited Nathan back for coffee. There was a perceptible tension that hung in the air, the loitering men had the hair on the back of my neck standing at attention. As a result, I became hyper-aware of the sounds around me, the creaks of the elevator as it shuddered and jolted its way down to meet me, the pipes that ran through the walls of the old building, groaning and moaning with age. When the elevator doors opened, I stepped inside. The man in the lobby dashed inside with me, and I backed away into the corner of the compartment in surprise. He didn't say a word to me, and kept his eyes straight ahead. I pressed the fourth floor button, and the doors closed. Are you new here? I asked, my voice small. He didn't turn around, and he didn't reply. His silence terrified me. I rapidly took in his attire. Black work boots, jeans, and a long black sleeve t-shirt. You're in danger. Get the fuck out. As soon as the doors opened, I made a run for it. I dashed toward the emergency exit at the opposite end of the hallway. There was another man waiting outside my apartment. I yanked the emergency door open and took the steps down, two at a time. My heart hammered wildly in my chest, and my throat ran dry. I heard them clattering down the steps behind me. I can't outrun them. Starting to panic, I missed a few steps and skidded painfully on the sharp edges of the concrete. I righted myself quickly and kept going, racing down as fast as I could go. I guessed I was less than a couple yards ahead of them the whole way. Had they been yelling or shouting at me, it may have helped, but it was their silence, even as they ran, that made my blood run cold. Professionals. The exit lay ahead of me, and I wanted to cry with relief as it came into sight. I at least had a chance. Flying through it, I heard the door bash angrily against the brick wall. I leapt out from the top landing and smashed into the body of a third man. As he caught me, his vice-like grip tightened around my neck. I struggled in his arms with what little energy I had left. Something hard slammed into the back of my head. For a brief moment, I felt like my brain exploded. Bright lights danced, screaming in my line of vision. 
And then, nothing. Chapter 10 Dinner last night had been amazing. Just being close to her, breathing in her scent, watching her sweet lips as they formed a smile. I hadn't wanted it to end. When I'd held her in my arms, it took everything in me to slow down. I desperately wanted to make love to her, to bury myself in her warmth, to pleasure her until I could feel her explode and release. I had to cool it, though. She was human. Humans didn't feel the same kind of intensity for their mates that shifters felt. I'd known the moment I touched her in the forest that she was mine. It hadn't been difficult setting events into motion so that I could see her again. It was simply a matter of getting my investigators to track her down using her friend's license plate numbers, then hiring her PR firm. Now, I'd have to prove my worthiness to her and have patience, allow her feelings to develop, and, at some point, I needed to reveal my bear without her riling in disgust or running scared. Simple. Not so simple. This morning, I had to go for a 10-mile run just to try and keep my bear sated and beneath my skin. When I got back to the apartment to shower and change, my brother languishing on the sofa didn't help my mood. I considered his presence to be an unnecessary pain in my ass. He had a home of his own to go to, albeit a crappy shithole that stunk of takeout, but that was his problem, not mine. Evidently, my housekeeper Lucinda agreed. She kept muttering under her breath as she went from room to room, trying to vacuum up the crumbs and collect the empty beer bottles he left in his wake. Byron, please tell me today's the day you're getting the hell out of my home. I used the end of a pen to pick up a pair of boxer shorts that he'd left strewn over the coffee table. The kid was disgusting. I can't go home, I'm telling you. The Baumar clan has it in for me, it's not safe. He groaned from under a blanket. And what time is it anyway? Time you got out of bed, I muttered, downing some of my black coffee before I had the urge to do more damage to his already broken arm. It's not like you haven't gotten the space. I swear, Nathan, you're one cold-hearted motherfucker. I rolled my eyes. It wasn't anything I hadn't heard before. Byron had a convenient habit of forgetting those times I did things to help him and holding on to times when I decided enough was enough and pushed him to stand on his own two feet. We came from a purebred bloodline of Colorado's most powerful shifter clan. He had, in a way, been inclined to work for it. My brother could have had all the wealth and power that he wanted. Instead, he chose to get drunk and high and drunker. I've got to be in the office in five. You want me to take you anywhere? I offered. No, man, I'm telling you, they're out to get me. I'll be a dead man. Byron, it's your own goddamn fault. I swear, next time you get into a fight with the Baumar, I'm not going to be around to help you out. The Baumar clan were another of Colorado's old shifting families. There had been years of antagonism between the two clans that in the last decade I had been doing my best to smooth over. They were a mean bunch, vicious, cruel, and entitled. They spent years terrorizing the Littleton district, till we eventually came to a peaceful agreement, which cost me millions. To have my brother's antics threaten to mess it up, when we were experiencing our first few years of peace, was infuriating. Whatever, they started it, Byron retorted. I just refused to back down. That jerk got what was coming. What was coming? That jerk got away clean. You're the one with the broken arm. I laughed at him. Anyway, I'm leaving. I'm calling Lucinda at lunchtime. If you're not out, I'm coming home to drag your ass out. He mumbled an expletive under his breath, which I ignored. I drove to work, blasting an oldie station so loud that the body of my car shook. For some reason, it was the only way I could actually focus, by drowning out everything else. The office was calling my cell, but I ignored it. Whatever it was, it could wait till I arrived. Chloe, my bear wanted her so badly. I wanted her. The whole thing was unusual. A human and a shifter, creating such a bond. I'd slept with countless human women before. None of them had called to my bear. None had produced the same effect on me that Chloe did just by smiling, 
just by walking across a gas station parking lot in short shorts. Fuck! I punched the steering wheel. I wasn't a man who harbored an abundance of patience. When I wanted something, I got it. I wanted Chloe. Some asshole in a Hummer ripped past me, laying on his horn. I realized I'd been stopped at a green light. I really was losing my mind over her. I cut the music and drove the rest of the way to work in silence. As I pulled into the underground garage, Elle came running toward me. Nathan! Nathan! Shit! Something's happened! Her face was ghostly pale, and she reeked of fear. Elle, calm down. What's happened? It's the Balmars. They've got your date, Chloe. She took a deep, shuddering breath. They said you need to come alone to meet them, or they'll kill her. I'm so sorry. She cried out in anguish. It's okay, Elle. I tried my best to comfort her. Inside, I turned to stone. Fear ran through me, shutting down any emotion and letting an icy rage take over. I would arrive alone, but it wouldn't stop me from ripping each and every one of those bastards to shreds. If they had so much as harmed a hair on her head, I would annihilate their entire clan. Where did they say to go? I asked calmly. Elle looked up at me, wide-eyed in shock. There's an old bar on South Summer Road. They said you'd know it, she whispered, drying her tears and trying to match my composure. I know it. I did. It had been the place where shifter feuds were once resolved, through fights to the death. Well, if that's what Baumar wanted, that's what they would get. Chapter 11 I didn't know how long I'd been out, or where I was, but a shooting pain throbbed in my temple. Looking around the room, I assumed I was in a basement of some kind, but it was too dark to be sure. Above me, I heard footsteps, a low murmur of voices, and the occasional shout of laughter. I didn't know and couldn't even begin to imagine who these men were or what they wanted with me. The only thing I knew for sure was that I'd been specifically targeted. They had known where I lived and had hunted me down with purpose, but why? The room was cold and dank and I had no coat or sweater to keep me warm. I sat in the corner, too frightened to move around, trying to get my eyes to adjust to the darkness. Just as I was beginning to make out the shapes of what I guessed to be farming equipment in the far corner, light flooded the room. Two of the men who had attacked me walked in. They turned on the light, a dim, solitary bulb that hung naked in the middle of the room. Beneath it, they set out chairs and an old wooden crate. Why am I here? I asked eventually, watching them move about the room as if I didn't exist. They ignored my question. They ignored me. Not even once did they glance in my direction. One of the men took out a deck of cards, whilst the other popped open a beer. Please, what's going on, goddammit? The silence was starting to gnaw away at me, like I was losing my grip on reality. I didn't understand how I'd been out on a date on a summer evening, dizzy with lust and longing, and had now been transported into a hell that made no rational sense. Lady, keep your mouth shut. One of the men turned around and snarled at me, his eyes flashing in the darkness. They were a different color, but they reminded me of Nathan's eyes. They had the same electric sparks that marked both men as something other. What the hell have I gotten myself wrapped up in? What are you going to do with me? I asked, trying to stop my voice from quivering. I didn't want to give these men the satisfaction. Nothing. We're just waiting for your boyfriend to get here. You're bait, baby. They laughed and returned their attention to the card game. If you're talking about Nathan Varga, he's not my boyfriend, I cried back. You've made a mistake. I went on one date with him. A date I was now regretting. I didn't know what Nathan was mixed up in, but I didn't want any part of this. Lady, if you don't shut up, I'm going to rip your face off, the second man growled. You need to listen to me. I don't know if he will come for me. This is ridiculous. I stopped mid-sentence as one of the men rose from his chair. What the hell did I tell you? He loomed over me, the light in his eyes practically glowing. What were these men? 
my jaw went slack. The man in front of me seemed to be vibrating with energy. I watched as his muscles bulged, and his veins pulsated violently beneath his skin. I pushed my back against the wall, clutching my knees up to my chest in an effort to gain as much distance as I could. He let out an inhuman growl, tearing the sound from his chest. Then I heard the sounds of ripping, as if his skin was being pulled apart to let something within him escape. The growl turned into a roar that shook the building. I think I screamed. Shutting my eyes against the vision of the monster before me, I could hear the sounds of muscle and organ being squished and ripped apart. The laughter of the other men in the background, deep and throaty. Then silence. I opened my eyes. I expected to see a dead man on the floor, a body turned inside out. What I actually saw sent my head spinning wildly. A bear, a huge black grizzly stood on its hind legs peering down at me. It roared again, louder than before. Instinctively, I covered my ears, desperate to block out everything that appeared before me. My heart rate kick-started and I gasped for air, not realizing that I'd stopped breathing. Adrenaline surged. I desperately wanted to fight for my life. I didn't want to die here in a dank basement, alone and afraid, with men that could transform into animals. I scurried to my feet and lurched to the side. The bear raised a paw and with one swipe knocked me backward. My head slammed into the wall and I cried out in pain. Not giving up, I tried to make a run for it, sidestepping his great bulk. I was pushed back again, this time claws scraped across my chest. Blood dripped down my dress, and I felt lightheaded with terror. Give it up, lady, the other man called out. You don't want to make him mad, trust me, he laughed, and casually took another sip of beer. The bear just stood still watching me. I leaned back into the wall, my legs no longer able to support my body. I sunk down onto my knees. I was defeated and I saw the glow of triumph in the beast's eyes. Nathan, please help me. He was the only hope I had. Chapter 12 They had heard my approach. I got out of the car as the lieutenant of the Baumars stepped into the front yard to meet me. I recognized him from the peace talks. He was the top enforcer of the clan leader, and as despicable as his alpha. Where is she? I asked, not bothering to slow down my pace toward the house. Fucking wait, Varga. I want to talk to you. He held out his arm across my chest, trying to halt me. I grabbed it and twisted it sharply behind his back, hearing the satisfying sound of a bone cracking. He yelped in pain. Your brother brought this about. He started shit with the clan. We're just retaliating. I yanked his head toward mine. You don't touch humans. You don't touch my woman, and you certainly don't threaten me, I hissed at him. Was it the peace talks? Did you somehow get the idea that I was soft? Did you mistakenly believe that I would go easy on you? I tightened my grip on his arm, pushing it further up his back. He whimpered in pain. She's downstairs. We didn't touch her, I swear it. We'll see about that. I ushered him through the old barn. I could smell Chloe from here. Her scent that was like the sweet aroma of the mountains, and the acrid scent of her fear. It cut my soul. I had done this to her. This was my fault. I followed her scent in the direction of the basement. We descended the steps, my grip tight on the shifter. Chloe was in the far corner of the room, cowering behind a bear. I could now smell her blood, fresh and potent. My bear jolted inside me. It wanted out. Both shifters spun around to face me. I knew who they were. I threw the enforcer to the floor. Both of these men were the pride of the Balmar pack. They were trained killers, both having served time for human crimes, and both reportedly unmatched in their strength and brutality. I wanted to take Chloe in my arms, to just run from this place, make sure she was safe before I hunted each one of them down and repaid their torture in kind. But I couldn't. If I went to her now, they would gain the upper hand. We would both be dead. Just remember, your brother started this, Varga, the enforcer growled from the floor. You both die for his mistakes today. The bear started to gain on me. 
and the other shifter to join him. I took one look at Chloe's face, terrified and confused, and I knew what I was about to do would cause me to lose her forever. The realization added to my fury. I had planned to break it to her gently in the kindest way I could. Now, she was getting a Shifter 101 in the most brutal way imaginable. I felt my bear tugging on me furiously. He wanted out. I didn't have an alternative option. I shifted. Chloe's scream echoed across the room, and I cursed myself along with the rest of the vile creatures for causing her pain. Roaring, I fell upon the first Shifter. He tore at my back with his claws, but it was too late. With a hunger I hadn't possessed since the times of peace started, my teeth tore into the flesh and fur at his neck. His blood seeped into my mouth, his body whipping and jolting as his life was cut short. The other bear leaped onto my back, digging in where I had already been sliced open. His claws raked at the raw flesh, and I howled with pain. No! I heard Chloe's cry, pleading, desperate. I wouldn't leave her here to die. I spun around, clubbing the bear's head backward. He pawed at me again, catching my snout. My own blood mingled with that of the dead bear. He opened his jaws, ready to bite down and deliver his death blow. I'm so sorry, Chloe. I heard a clatter and turned to see Chloe standing behind my would-be killer, with the chair leg raised in her hand. Distracted, the bear turned. I took the only chance I had left. Grabbing each side of his muzzle with my claws, I bit down, breaking his jaw with my own. I released him, and he reeled back. Swiping with my paw, I caught him around the throat, carving four deep gashes that instantly spurted bright red blood. His body fell to the floor. Behind me, I heard the enforcer scramble to his feet, running toward the stairs. I let him leave. I would find him later. Nathan? Chloe whispered her voice high and wavering. I lowered myself down on all fours, unable to look into her eyes, unwilling to see the disgust I knew would be there waiting for me. She hesitantly took a step closer. I tried to focus on shifting back, but with her so close and the scent of the dead shifters running through my veins, it was near impossible. My bear demanded he protect her. I felt something warm on my forehead. I looked up to see Chloe standing close her bare legs almost touching my nose. Her palm was pressed softly against my fur. Thank you, she whispered. I was hoping you'd come. My bear sighed with contentment at her touch. Inside, I felt my heart swell in response to the bittersweet token of her acceptance. She would probably never see me as anything more than a beast, but at least she didn't hate me. It was enough. For now. Chapter 13 We drove back to town in silence. There was a million things I wanted to ask, questions buzzing about my mind as it flipped itself inside out, trying to come to terms, logically, with what I'd witnessed. After the fight, Nathan had transformed back into a man. I had watched as the fur slowly receded from his body to be replaced by smooth skin. The huge bulk of the grizzly had adapted and transfigured into a human physique, tall, broad, perfect. Despite the awful strangeness, the horrific sounds that once again accompanied the transformation, when I looked at him, human, once again, I felt the same stirrings of carnal lust that I'd experienced on every encounter I'd ever had with the man. Only this time, he was naked. My own feelings disturbed me, more than anything else. I wanted to get home. I needed space to think, to process the nightmare that I'd lived the last few hours. But home didn't feel safe. The fact that those creatures knew where I lived made my home feel sullied and unwelcoming. I know you probably want to go home. Nathan broke the silence, anticipating my request. But it's not safe there at the moment. There are others, more of the Balmar clan, that pose a threat. I nodded slowly. Great. More half-humans happy to hunt me down in some kind of bear war, while the rest of the world remained completely oblivious to their existence. I'm so sorry, Chloe. I know you've been through a lot. 
I glanced over, watching his jaw twitch with repressed anger. I recalled the men saying that this was his brother's mess. I wonder if Nathan's anger was directed at the Balmar clan or his own kin. I have lots of questions, I replied as levelly as I could. But I need a shower, and I need food, and some rest. I... I don't know where to go. I want you to stay at my place, he hesitated. I know it's not ideal. It's probably the last place you want to be right now, but it's also the safest. I nodded again. No, it wasn't ideal. I wanted space from Nathan. I was so grateful that he'd saved me, but at the same time, I needed to process everything that had gone on tonight. I watched from the window as the landmarks started to look more familiar. Nearing the city, I started to feel better. There might be mythological creatures surrounding Denver, but there was also a Starbucks and a 7-Eleven. The world hadn't gone completely batshit. I'll stay with you, I murmured. He exhaled with relief, and I could practically feel some of the tension leaving his body. He was genuinely concerned, and the realization surprised me. I no longer understood what was going on between us, but perhaps the magnetic pull I seemed to have toward him was reciprocated. I didn't want to dwell on it. Whatever my body, and in all honestly my heart, felt, I needed cold, hard logic to take over for now. I need to know a few things first, I demanded. You can ask me anything, he replied, his tone somber and full of regret. Your abilities. Was it something you were born with? Have you always been this way? Yes, he nodded. It's passed through the genes. My father and mother were like this, and now so are my idiot brother and I. We come from a long line of shifters. And who are those guys? Another pack or something? Clan, he corrected. Yes, they've always been a problem. One I thought I'd solved until Byron fucked it up by starting a fight with them. He'd spoken about Byron on our date though obviously not about him being a bear. Oh, the bear in the woods. When I saw you in the forest, was that Byron you were helping? That bear? Was that the fight that started this? Yes, he replied tersely. So Brianna and I had witnessed a shifter fight. Wow, the thought that Brianna had been tending to a half-human bear made me feel slightly hysterical and I started giggling. What? Nathan asked, bemused. Nothing, it's just... Jesus, I can't get my head around this. I need coffee. I groaned, my hysteria subsiding as a pounding headache grew in its place. We're almost home. I have coffee. I nodded and hoped he'd also had a shit ton of painkillers and a powerful shower. I leaned back into the plush car seat, closing my eyes. The questions would just have to wait. Chapter 14 I let her sleep. As soon as we got home, she made a beeline to the shower. When she emerged, she was wrapped in my bathrobe, only her toes and face visible from the swaths of terry cloth that engulfed her. Color had been restored to her cheeks, and her damp hair smelled summer orchard sweet. My bear had tugged at me again, and I felt my heart on, rock solid and needy, pressing uncomfortably against my suit pants. I'd shown her to the guest bedroom, thinking she'd be more comfortable without being surrounded by my things. It was now seven in the evening, and she still hadn't woken. I had spent the day working from home, but it had been torture knowing that Chloe's naked body was nearby. The thought of her laying between the cotton sheets, her hair and skin pressed against my pillows, her soft, large breasts exposed, was enough to drive me near insane with distraction. The only blessing was the absence of Byron. Had he been here, my rage at his stupidity and the selfishness of his actions would have potentially put him in an early grave. You look angry, 
I'd been so consumed by the thoughts of my brother, I hadn't heard her enter the room. She looked rumpled and adorable, a light crease across her cheek where she'd slept. I was thinking about my brother. I smiled, pulling out a chair. Good morning. Don't you mean good evening? She asked, looking out across the city expanse, visible from the window. Morning for you. Coffee? Yes, please. I set about brewing a fresh pot, noticing with satisfaction that she sat on the chair next to mine. Part of me had been worried that when she awoke, she'd run screaming from my apartment. But even in the short time I had known Chloe, I should have realized that she wasn't the kind of woman to run. She was brave, bold, and courageous. In truth, I was in awe. How are you feeling? Like I've just been in a mental car crash? I'm still having a hard time believing everything. Well, if you have questions, I'll answer as honestly as I can. She didn't say anything for a while, and it was only after she took her first sip of coffee that she spoke again. Were you ever going to tell me? I sighed. That was a complex question. I didn't know how to reply without telling her how I truly felt about her. Yes, I said eventually. If things had gone as I'd hoped between us, I would have tried to break it to you gently. A corner of her mouth turned up at that, and I could see the barest tint of amusement dancing in her eyes. Break it to me gently? How did you think you'd accomplish that? Honestly? I laughed. I had no fucking idea. I've never... well... I've never felt this connection with another human, or shifter for that matter. She took another sip of coffee, and I could see her digesting the information. Do shifters normally only date other shifters? Dating was a strange term for the bonding that took place between mates, but I knew what she meant. I also knew that humans had no concept of the strength of two souls entwining completely, the way we did in the shifter world. Our bonds were sacred, unchanging, and forever. As far as I know, yes. Oh. She looked down at her coffee, not meeting my eyes. But everyone is different, and I've never felt the way I do about you before, not with a human or a shifter. It was as close as I could get to the truth. The brief second she took to reply felt like an eternity. I'd put myself on the line. Emotional exposure wasn't something I was used to. Oh, she said again, but this time I could see a small smile teasing at the edge of her lips. Her bathrobe had fallen open slightly at the top, revealing the plump curve of her cleavage, moving slowly with the rise and fall of her chest. I wanted to claim her, to move her luscious hair from her neck and expose the soft, silky skin of her throat, to mark her with a bite that would show the world that this woman belonged to me. Marking her as my own would seal our unbreakable bond, so that I would never have to spend another day of my life without seeing, touching, or being allowed to pleasure Chloe Carpenter. I carefully took the coffee cup out of her hands and placed it down on the table. I did move her hair, tilting her chin up toward me, but only to kiss her softly on the lips. She tasted like mint and coffee, and I groaned as I parted her lips with mine, wanting to drown in her taste, to lick and kiss every inch of her. The kiss seemed to have the same effect on her as it did on me. She rose out of the chair, pressing her body to mine. I squeezed her full, ample bottom and drew her against my erection so that she could feel how much I wanted her. She gasped, but clung to the back of my shirt, driving me closer. I don't know how I feel, she said, breaking away from me. But I want you. I need you inside me. I need you to make me feel safe again. I nodded, gazing into her clear brown eyes, praying that I'd be able to melt away from her furrowed brow. I never wanted Chloe to feel like she was in danger ever again. I would eagerly end anyone who threatened her. 
Hell, I'd wipe out the entire world if that's what it took to keep her safe. She kissed me again, and I picked her up in my arms, wrapping her legs around my waist. I could smell her arousal, and feel the heat and wetness from between her thighs, pressed against my belt. Damn, it was nearly enough to make me lose all control. Gritting my teeth, I moved her through to my bedroom. I wanted to make Chloe scream with pleasure and ecstasy before I allowed myself to be lost in her. Chapter 15 It felt like tingles of electricity were tearing up and down inside my body and collecting at my core. The dampness of my arousal was flooding between my legs. Nathan's arms around me and his body pressed against me were on fire, but it was nothing compared to the scorching gaze he held fixed on me. His eyes were glowing again, the navy midnight storm brewing within him, hypnotizing me. Nathan laid me gently on the bed, parting the soft robe and exposing my body to the cool temperature of the room. My nipples pebbled, and goosebumps ran lightly across my skin as he moved his body away from mine and stood looking down at me. My chest heaved, nerves and anxiety now mixing with my desire as I lay completely exposed to him. His eyes were hooded and wanting, and his gaze drank in every curve and crevice of my body. Fuck, you're so beautiful. His voice was hoarse and ragged, his obvious hunger causing my body to tremble in anticipation of his touch. He removed his shirt, button by button, his scorching gaze never leaving my body. When his chest was finally exposed, the taut muscle and undulations of his six-pack looked like they had been carved from marble. The raw, animalistic power that I knew simmered below the surface terrified me, but my body desperately ached for him. He discarded his pants on the floor and stood before me in designer boxers that could hardly contain his thick, heavy erection. My legs drew together in response to his sheer size, but he leaned forward and gently parted them. Don't hide from me, Chloe. He breathed. Please. He didn't remove his boxers. He knelt up on the bed, running his fingers up and down my thighs, and I started to relax. His fingers traveled slowly upward. He extended his index finger and ran it lightly along the sensitive lips of my core. I felt my muscles spasm and widen in response. He blushed at the juices that coated his finger. He inhaled sharply and his cock twitched beneath the cotton of his boxers. He continued to softly trace beneath my legs with his finger, exploring, his eyes watching my face for responses. My clit tightened and hardened, and as the tip of his finger traced it gently, my entire body quivered. Parting my legs wider, he slid me further up the bed. He began to kiss lightly up the length of my thigh, closer and closer to my center. Instinctively and wantonly, I moved toward him, desperate for more. He smirked, teasing me. I felt cool air dance between my legs as he blew gently on me. My head felt light as I gasped with pleasure. No longer able to look at what he was doing, I could only feel. My blindness made the sensations all the more overwhelming. I felt his tongue lick the length of my pussy. Its heat after the cool air made me cry out. My whole body responded, from the shivers at my neck to the curling of my toes. He lapped up my juices with his tongue, long and flickering licks that sent firecrackers shooting inside me. As the waves of my orgasm started to engulf my body, he pressed deeper, his tongue burrowing into my folds and his mouth clamped tightly over my pussy. Orgasmic waves crashed violently over me. Somewhere, I heard myself crying out his name, but I was lost in oblivion. Weak but wanting more, I rose up on my elbows. He smiled at me, 
a dirty and wicked grin that fluttered my stomach. He removed his boxers, his erection long and heavy, jutting out above his swollen ball sack. This time, rather than feeling overwhelmed by his size, I widened my legs greedily and felt my muscles expand and contract with need. The tip of his cock glistened with his seed. Before he could take control, I sat up and pulled his hips toward me. I glanced up at him, checking his reaction. The smirk was gone, and now his expression read surprise and full-blown lust. I licked the tip of his engorged direction, causing him to groan in response. The heady feeling of having this powerful man at my mercy was intoxicating. I slid my lips over him, wrapping them around his girth, tasting his hot, salty warmth in my throat. I moved my mouth up and down his shaft, feeling his heart rate accelerate wildly. When he entwined his fingers into my hair and balled them into fists, gripping my head, I sucked harder. A cry escaped his lips, and he pulled away. I don't want to come like this, he responded gruffly. I need to be inside you. I released him from my mouth and fell back onto the sheets. My body temperature felt a hundred degrees hotter than it should, and droplets of perspiration ran between my breasts. With his cock slick and coated in my saliva, he gently pushed at my opening. He bent his head and took my nipple between his teeth, teasing it with his tongue as inch by inch he slid himself inside me. I could feel my body stretch to accommodate him, his thickness and length stretching me and filling me completely. As he moved, the delicious friction of our skin caused me to cry out. Are you okay? He rasped, his eyes suddenly full of concern. God, yes. Don't stop. He pushed deeper inside me, then gently pulled back, finding a rhythm which would too soon make me lose all control. My legs wrapped around him, my heels digging into his sculpted ass. He buried his face between my breasts, a low growl emulating from deep within him. Our rhythm increased, growing faster and hotter. I wanted more. A deep yearning was spreading throughout my veins, the muscles of my channel clutching at him, driving him inside me. I felt the waves of another orgasm starting to build. He grasped my bottom, drawing me upwards, allowing himself to plunge deeper, filling every part of me. Fuck, he cried, and rode into me with a thrust that sent an orgasm ricocheting through every nerve ending in my body. I screamed, loudly, and then felt his hot, throbbing pulses as his seed flooded into me. Chapter 16 I drew her body closer to mine. She sighed with contentment as I kissed her lightly on the forehead. I couldn't seem to keep my hands off her. My fingers lightly traced the soft skin of her breasts, gently teasing the nipples as they hardened under my touch. She was exquisite, so beautiful. I could feel my cock growing hard, pushing against her thigh. When she smiled wickedly at me, I turned her over so that she faced the window and I could bury my head in her soft hair and sink my fingers into the full, round orbs of her ass. Again? I could hear the smile in her voice and nuzzled her neck in response. This is entirely your fault. I grinned, but I'll be gentle. In this position, I had to be. It was more aligned with natural bear mating, and had my bear crying out to claim her, scratching at my skin to take control. I wouldn't allow it. I desperately wanted to mark Chloe, claim her as my mate, and to bond fully with the woman I now knew, without a shadow of doubt, owned my heart and soul. But she was human and it was too soon to ask for forever from her. I kissed her shoulder blade, lightly running my tongue over the smattering of freckles that decorated her skin, tasting her sweetness. I closed my eyes, keeping my bear's urges to bite her at bay. My cock pressed against her ass cheek, my pre-cum leaving a trail on her skin. 
I slid between her legs. She was wet and warm and groaned softly as I entered her. Her arm reached back to clasp my thigh, and we moved against one another soundlessly, lost in the languid, lazy friction that was pounding waves of heat through our bodies. I never want you to leave my bed, I sighed against her skin. Then I won't, she replied softly. She turned over to face me, breaking us apart. She kissed me deeply, her tongue finding mine with a renewed needful energy. She drew me back inside her then, straddling me. I clutched her waist, watching her beautiful, soft, curvy body glide up and down on my cock. Fucking hell. She was a complete goddess. Her dark hair fell around her breasts as they swayed and bounced gently with her motion. Her breathing came in short gasps and her legs clasped against the sides of my body. She was close. I watch her, mesmerized by her beauty, as she took her pleasure from me. I thrust upward, moving my hips off the bed. Her eyes widened, and her pussy clenched me tightly as she cried out, my name falling sweetly from her lips. That was all it took. I couldn't hold back any longer, and my entire body exploding in release. Fuck, Chloe. She collapsed down next to me, smiling up at the ceiling. That was incredible, she sighed. I wondered if she could feel it, the strengthening of our bond every time we touched one another. I felt more in tune with her body, her moods, as if part of her now inhabited me. Are you hungry? I asked, feeling my own stomach knot with a ravenous appetite. Starved, she laughed. I'm going to order in. I don't really feel like sharing you with the world right now. We can eat on the terrace. Good. I feel the same way. She gave me a mischievous look. I also don't think we should move too far from the bed. I couldn't agree more. Chloe stood and retrieved herself a fresh white shirt from my closet and brought it back to the bed. I smiled. Just the thought of watching Chloe spend the evening in a shirt that only just covered her sexy ass made my balls ache. This will do, she smiled back at me. I reached for my cell. I couldn't remember the last time I'd eaten at home in the evening, and I'd never done it with a woman before. It felt good. Natural. For the first time since I'd moved in five years ago, my apartment suddenly felt like a home. Chapter 17 Nathan's terrace was spectacular. Its view overlooked the twinkling lights of the city below and the mountains beyond. A few candles I'd found in Nathan's kitchen drawers flickered on the table. We'd ordered Korean food. The takeout boxes cluttered the table because Nathan had distracted me with his neck kisses when I'd tried to plate up the food. He held my foot in his lap his fingers running up and down my leg while we ate. The evening was perfect, and I wanted to get lost in the moment, but all I could think about was returning to his bed. Something strange had happened when we slept together. I didn't understand it, and I wasn't sure if it was just my hormones going crazy after sex, but I felt connected to him on a deeply profound level that I couldn't explain. This whole thing just felt so... big. Do you feel... I started to ask him if he was experiencing the enormity of emotions that I was, but stopped suddenly, afraid he'd think I was crazy. He smiled at me, his eyes burning bright. The connection? He replied. Exactly. I feel like... I don't know. Like I can feel your moods. Like you're inside my head, or something. I trailed off. I needed help here, before I started sounded like an infatuated teenager. Good, Nathan answered, sounding relieved. Yes, I feel it. It's the start of a bonding process. He cleared his throat, and I could feel a nervous energy pass between us. I don't want to scare you off, but I think I know that my bear wants to claim you as my mate. Wasn't what we just did 
Mating? I asked, confused. Not exactly, he smirked. When a shifter claims his mate, he marks her. Marks her? A claiming bite. He laughed when he saw my expression. The bite is a mark that tells the world and other shifters that his mate has been claimed, forever bonded, he continued. Once mated, the process is irreversible. I know you're not ready for that yet. Wow. Are you? I asked with genuine amazement. Yes, he replied simply. But as a shifter, I know. I can feel it in every fiber of my being that you're mine. You're it for me. It's not the same for humans. I can't expect you to feel the same way. So we'll wait. He shrugged, unperturbed by the intensity of the conversation. I thought about it. The crazy potency of feelings I had for Nathan, which, in retrospect, I'd felt even that first day in the forest. It had grown exponentially in the ridiculously short time I'd known him, but forever? Was I ready for forever? I knew without a doubt that Nathan was the one for me. I couldn't walk away even if I wanted to. Now that I had experienced our connection, there wouldn't be a day or an hour that my body and soul didn't yearn to feel it renewed. I will never pressure you into anything. Nathan held my gaze. My feelings for you won't change however long it takes you to decide. I nodded. A blissful contentment saturated my entire being. This incredible man loved me, without wanting anything in return. I felt humbled. Am I interrupting? A man appeared through the kitchen doors, grinning at us both. Yes, you fucking are, Nathan growled at him. Hey, you're one of the girls from the forest. He smiled at me and held out his hand. I'm Byron, and I hear I'm the reason you spent the night in a dank basement. My sincerest apologies. The brother. I shook his hand, bemused. I had thought I'd feel anger toward the man responsible for such a mess. But there was something about him. A recklessness and a rebel charm that made it impossible to hate him on sight. He looked so much like Nathan. But Nathan cultivated an image of raw masculinity, tempered with the strength and control that would put the fear in any Ivy League business mogul. Byron was the kind of guy that put fear into the hearts of mothers, the poster boy for broken hearts, unplanned pregnancies, and bad choices. You're not forgiven, Nathan snapped. Chloe, I am so sorry. Byron beseeched my forgiveness again, practically getting down on one knee in earnestness. It's okay, I smiled at Nathan. It's nice to meet you, Byron. You too. He shot his brother a look of triumph. How are you feeling? I asked. After your fight. Fully recovered, so my generous brother is kicking me to the curb. You're lucky I haven't thrown you off the roof, idiot. Byron ignored him and turned his attentions back to me. Tell me more about your friend Bree, the girl who was so bear-friendly in the forest. I laughed. Not in a million years would Byron appeal to Brianna. His good looks couldn't be denied, but Bree was violently allergic to any whiff of bad boy impulses. Brianna, I corrected. She works at the same company I do. I'll introduce you if you like. He beamed at me, delighted. He didn't have a chance in hell, but I wasn't going to tell him that. Besides, after all my failed matchmaking attempts... Perhaps I wasn't the best person to judge what my friend actually wanted. All right, you got what you came for. Now get out, Nathan commanded. Byron backed away with his arms out in mock surrender. It was lovely to meet you, Chloe. Call me if he gets out of hand. Nathan rose to his feet, furious, and Byron turned and ran from the terrace. I burst out laughing. Seeing Nathan antagonized by his younger brother showed me a new side of him, one I hadn't seen yet, and it warmed me. 
I'm going to get him a collar and a bell, Nathan said in disgust. He's harmless, and it all turned out okay, I soothed him. I can think of a million things we can do to distract you, if that's what you want, I teased. He grabbed me, his mood suddenly light and playful. That's what I want, he smirked. Good, it's what I want too. I smiled up at him and batted my lashes, and he tightened his grip around my waist. And while we're at it, we'll talk about that claiming thing. I looked up into his eyes, wanting him to read the unspoken promise in mine. He nodded perceptibly. Suddenly, I could think of nothing I wanted more than Nathan. Forever. The End This has been Nathan, Billionaire Bear, Shifters of Denver Book One, written by Candace Ayers. Narrated by Erin Marie. Copyright 2018 by Lovestruck Romance. Production copyright 2018 by Candace Ayers.